Okay, it's uh, nine o'clock. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, to some of us, obviously. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to uh, to be presenting together with an excellent team a uh, second time around. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Welcome to our session on governing AI and education technologies, transforming education globally. Um, first, I would like to uh, quickly present, I hope that you're seeing my slides. Just very quickly um, uh, nod if there are any problems. Um, I would like to present my colleagues um, and uh, outline the structure of our workshop and quickly move on to the presentations and discussions as we have a full hour packed and also equally I wish to hear from the audience. We have Roberto Zambrana on site. Uh, Roberto is from Bolivia. He's an electronic engineer with a master's degree in telecommunications networks. He's a tenured teacher at San Andres University and professor in postgraduate programs in four other universities in Bolivia. He's an international instructor and moderator for Internet Society Training Program. He's also participating in the IGF Policy Network on Meaningful Access. We're immensely grateful to have Roberto on site to moderate our session and address our extended audiences offline. As such, we are uh, delivering a hybrid workshop. It's uh, my first, I must admit, which gives us uh, at the same time an incredible opportunity to extend our research and uh, reach out a wider audience. Uh, with us is uh, Molly Esquivel. It's very late at her end, and I'm so grateful that, that she's keeping it up and strong, has an extra cup of coffee. Uh, she's currently doing research for her doctorate in education with Concordia University Irvine in California. Molly is also a teacher in science in middle school in California and is a mom of three very young children. So praise to her. Um, while she delves into the realm of uh, teachers' perceptions, challenges, experiences with advancing technologies every day, Molly is also um, a first-hand witness of how technologies impact learning, children, and also her own profession as an educator. So there's so much we want to hear from her. We have Dr. Samantha K. Johnston uh, with us. She's a researcher, a research officer at the Oxford uh, University Center in Oxford. Using a co uh, cognitive psychology lens, Samantha's expertise and interests lie at the intersection of education and psychology. She aims to link these areas with evidence-based e-learning technologies to improve teaching, learning, and assessment outcomes. Samantha's presentation will explore and interrogate critical reading readiness through a global South lens and discuss what this means for the evolution and governance of algorithmic decision-making systems. Uh, moving towards the wider context, the cost of connection, uh, we will hear from Dr. Priscilla Gonzalez, uh, founder of Instituto Educa Digital, an organization that has been working for 25 years on behalf of Brazilian public education. Unfortunately, Priscilla couldn't be uh, present with us. However, we've got her pre-recorded presentation, so we will have the feeling that she is with us, and I really appreciate the, the work that she's done. Uh, it's a very important research that she's presenting on the substantial infrastructure concentration in Brazil and South America, more broadly by big tech uh, uh, companies coming from the Silicon Valley. And last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Emmanuel Ogu on the pressing question, could AI injustice have man-made foundations? Uh, when school administrators have to choose between edtech solutions that they don't understand, what are the implications of data being collected and how data is processed and stored? This ignorance, sort of ignorance, is extended and imposed upon learners in the form of edtech solutions which impact what they don't understand because their choices haven't been considered. Emmanuel will draw in on a number of case scenarios from where these critical questions emerge within the African context, also strikingly similar to the North and South American, the Caribbean and the European contexts that, that we, we present research from today, but also the need for governing and scrutiny of edtech and AI as businesses, which will be the last topic I will briefly um, uh, cover. Um, I do uh, wish to present a very brief glossary um, and we should begin with, 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 with some kind of, you know, uh, basic terms, which undoubtedly might evoke uh, differing interpretations and thoughts, but at least it's a starting point for our presentations. We have the word at tech, we, you know, we're using in our vocabulary nearly every day, at least for the research within education context. 
It stands for education technologies, such as applications and platforms. However, as you will see from Priscilla's presentation, for example, these are only part of the stacking. At, at the bottom, these are substantial concentration of very big tech companies at play. AI, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, means the ability of a computer or a robot controlled by a computer to do tasks that are usually done by humans because they require human intelligence and discernment. Although there are uh, no AIs that can perform the wide variety of tasks an ordinary human can do, um, um, some AIs can match humans in specific tasks. In education, not all edtechs are AI. We must be clear about this. And no AI can completely replace a human task, at least yet. Edtech provider is typically, these are private businesses, and I, I cannot stress enough on that. They create, develop, and sell software apps and platforms for instruction, assessment, and so on. Edtech users can be children, young people, teachers, administrators, uh, but also a whole lot of other stakeholders if we consider the secondary output, the secondary product from edtech use, which is education data. And that leads me to the term education data itself, which is data collected about students, data generated by a student when they use edtech. Um, and uh, just a, a very quick word about me. So I'm a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and former fellow at Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School and the founder of EDDS, an independent research organization working at the intersection of edtech, AI, and education. But according to my youngest son, I am this person holding a pen, uh, which only means that we, what, we really have to bring in children and young people's voices in these discussions about edtech and AI. Without further ado, uh, let's hear from Molly on what is everyday like in schools for a teacher juggling advancing technologies. Molly, take it away, please. We can hear you now, Molly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Brilliant. So I'm here to present on the, what I perceive to be the invisibility cloak that EdTech has cast upon the pedagogic process um, and the classrooms in the K-12 system. As my colleague Veli has mentioned, I am a junior high school science teacher, and I have been a science teacher for eight years. However, I have aspired to be a teacher my entire life. Um, we can all in this moment think of a teacher that has impacted us positively, and I liken it to the weather. You can always talk to someone about a teacher. And... The, the education that I grew up with is not the education that I'm witnessing as a teacher. So first and foremost, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues for giving me the opportunity as a practitioner to exercise my voice on this platform because the practitioner's voice is often never heard. So... First and foremost, I'd like to begin with a quote. Decisions and legislation are often driven by the values and ethics held by the present dominant power. And the classroom is no different. So the teacher is the one that gets to decide what's important based on one's moral and ethical code. And those values lie at the heart of the classroom community. And it's society that the ethical code builds their moral constructs and, and builds civilization together. And, and we thrive under what we refer to as the social contract. And it's these individuals that are willing to make sacrifices if it means that everybody gets to benefit in what we refer to as the greater good. And again, the classroom is no different. So students take turns, they share materials, they share space. And in, it, this is all in the name of, of learning and education. And so as a social process, we take responsibility and we, we, sh we, we shift from human 
to automation, as, as we shift from human to automation, we really need to ask ourselves, what do societies look like when algorithms slowly encroach on this decision-making sphere? So when, when teachers are no longer making 100% of the decisions with these values and ethics behind them, we really need to we we really need to pump the brakes here and decide and really consider what our societies are going to look like as a whole. And that brings me in, right here, the pedagogist. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly, Molly. Okay, perfect. So I always say that teachers have a very special glimpse into the future, and we get the first glimpse at emerging trends and things like style and music and lingo and and while I cannot tell you what society will look like as a whole in the future I can tell you what a traditional U.S. junior high school classroom looks like right now and I can tell you that data mining automated prediction and machine learning is found in every single digital tool that I currently use in my classroom. Under traditional societal constructs and within uh, social groupings, we, we can dictate what is right, wrong, acceptable, typical, or not with each new integration of these AI tools or behavioral surveillance tools that evoke some kind of Pavlonian response. And all these children are, are subjected to that. <clears throat> and as a pedagogist, I witness that daily, and I don't get a say as to whether these tools are used or not. And so I am witnessing my autonomy as a teacher slowly get taken from me over time. All the while, I've watched my students' behaviors become modified by a device that's in their hand. And so, you know, EdTech was initially introduced as a, a tool to supplement my practice, but now it's not so much the case. Now my kids are being, my students are being plopped in front of a device and this, this, Artificial intelligence is the one that is either making the initial decision or prompting a future decision on behalf of me and my students. And so, as I said, EdTech was initially introduced as a tool that teachers could incorporate into our instruction in novel and creative ways. Yet somehow now, schools are depending on it for the entire school day and even beyond with homework and and textbooks at home. And in a growing body of research now, scholars are now unveiling how the integration of technology is undermining and redefining me as a, as a pedagogist, as a teacher. And it's, it's robbing me of my autonomy. And so these, the, the scholars such as, as Friesen and, and Perota and Goulson and Williamson and, and Winsenberger and, and ZD2020 and, and even my colleague, uh, Dr. Hillman, we've, we've all explored these, these concepts and, and we highlight these perspectives and the integration of public education system, of AI into public education systems. And, and I've really observed how the private infrastructure, how, how, um, the privatization of education is is taking over, and it's it's Im imposing these constraints on the freedoms of everybody involved. And um, I wanted to highlight an example: the dashboard. And so the dashboards, as you can see here, is is just data. It's just a bunch of data that's collected on students. And it's it was an attempt to offer convenient views on how our students were doing in a real time uh, performance display. Um, but what we're finding is these are not always neutral representations of learning. And it's it's kind of a way for, it's kind of been a way of education to kind of double down 
on artificial intelligence. Uh, the first being AI to assess students, and the second being this quote-unquote impartial dash dashboard meant to steer the pedagogic process. Um, and what it does for us is it, it goes back to the, the title of my, my talk here, the invisible, the invisibility of all of it is, is, is parents and other stakeholders don't see all oh, all of this data, look at all of this data, all of these charts, all of these colors. And it's really capitalizing on our teachers and their incessant need for order and control and structure. And, and to if, if we can walk away from getting our kids from red to green, then we can feel like we have, have accomplished something when in reality, have we? It's all it's kind of erroneous data that when in reality we haven't really even been trained on how to use or do any of this we're pedagogists we're experts in education we're not experts in statistics or analyzing data we're experts in teaching kids how to read and do math um and and all of this information is in, is stored on invisible lines of digital code and, and now we're, as institutions, dependent on this. And I see a problem with that. So I make some recommendations. I believe that as policymakers, we really need to consider this, this concept of relational ethics. Um, we need to examine and assess how AI systems are integrated and used in education, how they will affect children and all stakeholders really in the long run. Um, we, we need to consider how these predictive tools affect kids in the long run. And furthermore, we really need to recognize that key stakeholders in education do we really need artificial intelligence? Can we depend on the experts and their their uh, pedagogic pedagogical expertise alone? Like, who decided that artificial intelligence was of the utmost importance and needed to be in our sphere in the first in the first place? So discussions within AI systems, ed tech providers, and other stakeholders are really needed to reach a broad consensus for standardized benchmarking and transparent conditions and obligations and uh, transparency, accountability measures. They, they need to be set up to use these algorithms and data processing appropriately, effectively, um, thoughtfully, intentionally, and furthermore, again, to kind of um, give credit to my colleague, Dr. Hillman, she also brings up the notion that some of these providers, if not most of these providers are not even licensed to really make these judgment calls or to operate in the first place in this educational sphere themselves. They're not the experts, we are as the practitioner. And we really need to establish clarity with regard to who is liable when things go wrong. Is it going to be education? Is it going to be the K-12 system? Or is it going to be um, those that intruded in this space in the first place, ed tech? And so we, we really need to consider the long-term effects before we just start unrolling these things into the classroom and how it's truly going to affect kids. Kids are more than just a number they are people. And like I said, I and I entered this profession admiring my teachers. And the profession right now does not look anything like it did when I was a young girl admiring those that stood before me. So thank you. Thank you, Molly. That was really compelling presentation. I already have questions for you, but let's hear next from Samantha on what are the premises, promises, and perils for literacy and reading readiness in Caribbean and African contexts.
Thank you so much, Belly, and also to Molly for starting us off with such an interesting perspective. And I too have some questions, so I can't wait to get into our discussions um, today. And it links into some of the things that I was speaking about. And I am quite excited to really share with you today about this concept of critical reading readiness. And importantly, when we speak about this context, I will explore and really interrogate, interrogate critical reading readiness through a global south lens and really discuss what this means for the evolution and governance governance of data and algorithmic decision making systems but before i really delve into this talk talk i just want to really acknowledge that when we discuss or present this broad term of the global south there is always sort of a challenge of how to include this vast array of countries and cultures into this single concept. So I just wanted to highlight that there's differences when we speak about um, the global south, for example, with discussions around internal differences itself should really play in an important part in the discussion. But for for today's context and given you know given the time the constraints in time I have decided to focus on the Caribbean region. So for example countries such as um, Barbados and Jamaica, for example, and also two countries in Africa, Ghana and Nigeria, with which I've had previous um, interactions in terms of workshops and research. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Now, when we think about these contexts and really along with the emergence of different types of technologies, there are really differences in diverse digital spaces that have been open. And as a result of that, we have an increase in misinformation, disinformation, and even polarization. So across the world, what this has done is has really shaped the direction of the internet and those who govern it. Um, and now there is sort of a renewed interest in the, the skills that children young and young people really require to responsibly navigate digital environments. Now, one area of upskilling that has really taken effect is really the need to focus on this concept of digital intelligence. Now, digital intelligence, it comprises, as you can see here on screen, 24 skills across eight competency areas. And as visualized here on the screen, it really is a, an area that looks at things like digital use, digital safety, etc. as you can see. Now, it really, the concept of digital intelligence, it's really recognized as a really important part of supporting future generations to really grapple with big questions and the challenges that we see being of importance and emerging within the 21st century. And one of the things that I wanted to, to highlight is that even though we have these different competency area, areas, I'll focus on digital literacy, which takes into consideration things like AI literacy, computational literacy, et cetera, and more specifically, critical reading readiness. And really what this construct really means is that it involves two areas. So skills, meaning the skills that students need to evaluate, interpret, and analyze, but also critical reading disposition. So one of the things in the literature, especially around skills that attributes that students need is that we are often so focused on the skill and we tend to not focus on the dispositional element, which is the willingness to use their critical reading skill. So in any sort of approach or intervention to elevate students' voices in the governance of the internet and equipping them with these skills, um, it's important to focus on the skills component, but also the, the, the dispositional element, the willingness to do that. Now, as of March, 2020, the internet has reached over, you know, almost 50 or almost 60 percent of the world's population and we can see um, that the greatest rates of increase in internet penetration over the last decades have really occurred in in places like africa middle east latin america and the caribbean and even asia um, with it, in fact asia being home to over half of the world's internet 
users. Now, of course, this has also increased beyond that time because of COVID and the requirement to access online learning spaces. So although we have some work to achieve in terms of universal access, in terms of access to the internet, these upward trends for access in the global South nations is, is a good news. But I must pause here to really acknowledge that while there is an increase in usage and really this steady progression, um, and we've sort of, we're, we're aiming to reduce the, you know, the first digital divide access to internet spaces and infrastructure. There really continues to be the second digital divide such that countries in the global South are still exponentially behind their global North countries in terms of being able to have the skills and the dispositions and really the actions that are needed to engage critically in spaces of what internet governance might look like and having these meaningful conversations about how the internet should be governed, especially given consideration to the diverse population that really relies on the internet within the global south. So, you know, although we know that there is still a second digital divide, unfortunately, um, one of the things that we haven't learned so much so within the case of the Caribbean, especially in when I use Jamaica and Barbados as an example, we don't yet have a good understanding of essentially, we don't have a, a global understanding of how well students in these countries are able to critically read and therefore the extent to which they're critically, they're able to meaningfully have sort of the skills and dispositions to meaningfully contribute to conversations around internet governance and pictured here on screen is really and I do a lot of work in the assessment space and here on screen is really an overview of education systems that participate in the international computer and information literacy study which is really a global opportunity offered by the international association for evaluation of educational achievement and in this study it tends to assess students readiness to responsibly participate in the digital world including and related to students opportunities and also not necessarily opportunities but their readiness to participate in conversations related to internet governance and as you can see here on screen well, since its inception in 2013, there has been really minimal participation from global South context. And you can see it's very European dominated in terms of education systems that participate. And this is very, you know, it's further complicated by the lack of research on digital literacy patterns within the global South, um, as identified here in a recent bibliometric analysis. And it shows that for the most part, primarily global North countries are researching about and speaking more about this topic of digital literacy linking to internet governance. Um, and so we still have a gap in what the picture looks like in terms of are we really ready in the global south to really engage in these critical discussions around internet, in, internet governance. And also we need to really be elevating a little bit more the conversations and the research in this space as well. Um, you know, admittedly on screen here, there are some global South countries, Indonesia, for example, they're doing really well in terms of, you know, elevating these conversations, but by and large, there is still a gap um, and a lack of representation from countries in um, the global South. And just to provide you with a visualization is that um, we do have some, some evidence. We do have some evidence of student digital literacy. So in on this tool that is highlighted here, one of the things is that one of the thing, so you can essentially see that Jamaica here is um, is really showing um, the case of digital literacy here. So, sorry, that tool went by so quickly, but essentially the tool, once you go on the World Skills Clock, so the website is called the World Skills Clock, and once you visit that website, it's a collaboration between UNESCO, you can get a better sense of um, the percentage of students who are who have who are digitally literate within their own context and the presentation there and the demonstration was just showing around how you can find out a little bit more about Jamaica but when I come to the you know towards the end of the, the presentation today I, you know as a reminder at the beginning of the presentation I alluded to the following questions and I think it is an opportune time to bring them back to the forefront as you might be thinking given all of this limitation 
that we have in the limitations that we have from a global south perspective in terms of accessing comprehensive data on critical reading readiness in the global south context so what do we actually know about critical reading readiness and importantly um, what does this mean for internet governance so i just wanted to highlight using um, the context that i'm familiar with uh, these are just some of the initiatives that are currently happening within the global south context regarding critical reading readiness understanding how students are ready to operate and contribute meaningfully and critically to the conversations around internet governance so for example in jamaica there is currently a revamp of the national assessment plan and now students are being not only assessed on only basic reading skills but also critical thinking and critical reading so this was something that was done in 2020 and it's now ele being elevated more within the caribbean region i just want to bring attention to a project that I'm currently doing, Project Amplify, between Jamaica and Barbados. And the whole aim of this organ, this project is to collaborate with local organizations. We're starting off with the metaverse, and it's really around having young people and secondary school students being able to contribute to the conversations around what is the metaverse, how should the metaverse be governed, and what sort of recommendations can we implement as a Caribbean to make sure that when these digital technologies are infiltrated in our society, how can we ensure that they're properly governed? And Barbados has been a trendsetter in this area because they have their own internet governance forum and really it's a space to bring the Bayesian um, internet users together to ensure that the voices of this local population are being implemented into this global idea of some of the skills that students need to properly navigate the internet spaces. Um, I just also wanted to highlight some of the work that I've been involved in, but also um, collaborating in workshops and presenting on workshops in Nigeria and in Ghana. And one of the things that Nigeria is currently doing um, that I'm really happy about is that they're also revamping their um, assessment about what reading looks like um, through their national reading framework. But there are still some consideration that we need to give around how they're defining reading. So for example, currently it's sort of a narrow definition at the moment now, and it's really working together to ensure that this definition of what reading actually entails really takes into consideration this critical element and also forums such as the african internet um, governance forum um, i'm happy to see that taking place a lot um, the first forum was held back um, in uh, um, in nairobi in 2012 and in fact this year one of the thematic areas for the african internet governance forum was really focused on um, data protection, um, similar to things uh, that Molly spoke about, but also they're, all, they're also focused on digital skills and capacity development and linking this into what it means to be a responsible citizen in terms of making decisions for how the internet is governed. So in the end, this just essentially means that um, when students are provided with the opportunity to engage their critical read reading readiness skills, it, they are provided with the opportunity to really acquire these skills and dispositions that will really enable them to critically inter interrogate decisions around how algorithms work, as, as well as the evolutions of uh, algorithms and recommendation systems. In fact, this is a gap in the research. We still don't understand the evolutions of these decision-making systems. And of course, by providing them with these critical readiness um, skills and disposition, it provides them with access to understand the language used in this space. And by, by through that, we do have greater representations and diversification in who contributes to the conversations around internet governance. So as I close, I just wanted to share with you um, just this sentiment that I've been expressing throughout my conversations on internet governance is that meaningful, impactful, and responsible internet governance, it cannot occur without a representative voice. So thank you for listening um, today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Sam. It's so it's so uh, crucial to hear, you know, the the young people's voices, and obviously to to have that focus on on their skills, on their um, and and also understanding, you know, what their disposition is with regards to all these technologies coming into um, uh, um, into everyday into their everyday life, not only in education. Um, so next, we are going to. 
uh, play the um, uh, presentation of Priscilla um, and hear more on a macro level what's happening with where exactly uh, tech um, is coming from and concentrating, especially in um, Global South perspective with, with Global South perspective. Can everybody see the video? And I, 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 I and thanks very for. I'm just, uh, I'm just pausing for a second. Just uh, please do let me know. Do you hear the the audio? Presentation. Yes, we can. It's a pleasure to be part of IGF 2022. I'm recording this video because of time zone. I'm in Brazil. That is six hours behind Addis Ababa. So I will uh, talk a little bit with you about education under surveillance, infrastructure, and digital comp competencies misconceptions. Well, when I lead a workshop for educators, I usually emphasize as internet is a physical infrastructure made up of layers. That is important because in the educational field, it is common only consider the last layer, the most obvious layer, that is the websites and applications that we as users usually access. I like, I like to discuss with them what is the cloud? And I explain that the cloud is a metaphor for submarine cables and data centers and they always stay admired with this information. When I talk about influence in the educational ecosystem nowadays, we need to consider the new context of digital culture. This co context is totally different. It's totally taken by AI technologies based on data machine learning, deep learning. This current context is completely different from 20 years ago. At the beginning of the web, more than buy or adopt products or services uh, to support teaching and learning process. Now we have a data-driven business model. And this new model assumes that it's free of charge, but in fact, the payment is done with data. In our case, students and educator data. Our Education Under Surveillance Observatory has named MAPED where they mail servers from public universities and public secretaries of education state and city levels in Brazil and South America. Around 65% of the email servers are under the dominion of US tech companies. It is an issue related um, to data, of course, to data protection but also to public and strategy data that has been sent to big tech data centers, improving their business model without any kind of compensation for the local institutions. So instead of using data to improve education, schools have been contributing to commercial interests. You can access the website it is it has uh, english and spanish version and you can na navigate uh, between and in the map and you can see this red dot represents the institution who has their their, their data center email servers in external data centers in addition to the emails Basic education secretaries have been using applications from these big tech platforms and showing this as an innovation, when in fact 
they are replacing professional development to training teachers on proprietary tools like that. In conclusion, I'd like to bring a reflection about two frequent misconceptions or misbeliefs. The first one is related to a polarity between closed platforms and open source platforms, as if it were enough to choose or to change to an open source alternative, it would be a solution. But the solution is not simple because there is, there are, uh, uh, there is an ecosystem, uh, a huge ecosystem. Our studies in Brazil show that the most famous open source uh, or free soft software, like Moodle, used by online courses, are also hosted in big tech, the big tech data centers. And the second misconception is related to usual understanding that digital education is only about usability. We always hear about digital competencies, digital skills, assessment tools, and even open digital educational resources. The infrastructure layer that supports all of these that imbued political and economical issues has been always ignored. So we have some uh, important new digital literacy to um, promote when we consider AI governance in this tech education context. Being aware of the current social, political, economic context of digital culture. Technology is not just a tool, it's not neutral. The tools of technology should be a governance decision. Creativity and autonomy instead of dependence. How to uh, use open standards, in, mainly in educational fields. Human rights in the digital environment, digital rights should be an issue, a subject to teach or to discuss in schools. Regulatory frameworks for digital citizenship, individual versus collective responsibility. It's important to discuss with our students that it's not enough to think before posting because there are an ecosystem, there are an infrastructure system organized by platforms, by companies that are responsibility for these companies and for the government. And civic participation. How, uh, how might we promote AI, open data, for AI and open data for common good? I would like to share with you some of our recent studies and reports. They, uh, they, are, they were translated into English, so you can access the link and you share my presentation with you. Some articles about this problem uh, related to data and rights uh, in educational and childhood. Two studies, important studies that are uh, run by Internet Steering Committee in Brazil. I'm part of the study. One of them discussed the problem, the conception of platformization in education. And the second one is about the partnership, the disparities uh, in, in the this kind of partnership, the, the contract, the document that the secretaries of education establish with companies. And there will be the third study uh, related to ge geopolitical and infrastructure in March 2023. And uh, this report, it was launched in 2021. It was a partnership 
between my university, University of Continent, and Bristol University to discuss in a workshop how should be the new digital literacy and digital inclusion when we consider the contemporary Brazil. Contemporary Brazil, there is a mistake here. And uh, we can access my slides using this QR code, or I can send it to Belislava and she can uh, share with you. So I would like to thank you and have a nice panel. That was excellent. And I, I liked particularly uh, the the part on autonomy and uh, managing the dependence on, on technologies. And now let's uh, hear from Emmanuel. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleased to be here. Good morning from Nigeria. I would be speaking about, um, I was speaking on the topic. Um, can AI injustice have unintended or uh, unintended uh, human foundations or foundations in the people um, that administer or choose the technology? So basically, what we see is that um, educational institutions are increasingly turning to edtech products to scale their capacity for digital and e-learning. But then the problem, you know, continues to exist that um, even though the affordances of edtech is well established in terms of how it helps educational institutions scale, scale capacity um, and build resilience, even in difficult times like we saw during the pandemic. You know, one question is often frequently missing in conversations about um, what edtech to adopt and how to go about this. And this is the question of at what cost? And by cost, I'm not referring to pricing or purchasing, but rather I'm talking about the potential impact and consequences. You see, the reality remains that um, when school administrators have to choose between edtech solutions that they do not understand, you know, what the implications are of the data that is being collected and how such data is processed and stored. What happens is that this ignorance is extended and basically imposed upon learners in the form of edtech solutions, you know, which impact they do not understand because their choices have not been considered. I'll quickly share three case studies and then move over to the crux of the problem before I end with recommendations. So between December 2021 and January 2022, an edtech organization, Illuminate um, Education and edtech solution rather, fell victim to a cyber attack that exposed the personal data of millions of users across America, including 800,000 current and former students across 700 public schools in New York City. The cyber attack on Illuminate Education leaked personal data, including race and ethnicity data, as well as students' test scores. Um, it even included um, information about um, students' tardiness ratings, migrant status, behavioral incidents, and descriptions of disabilities. And in the second case study, in the periods between late 2020, even until early 2022, students, faculty, and um, alumni have continued to speak out about some issues relating to Proctorio. Proctorio is a popular ed tech solution that is in use across America and the Caribbean. Um, and these issues range from issues of invasions of privacy, bias against students of color, bias against students with accessibility needs and learning disabilities like neurodivergence and anxiety, bias against low-income and rural students, harm to transgender students, against you know, a list of other issues. Uh, and the final um, case study has to do with the rise in protests against edtech solutions that we have begun to see um, emerging in digital spaces. This trend has been described with phrases like edtech resistance, edtech activism, and edtech lash. But then what is the crux of the problem? You see the global, the global transition to online learning in the aftermath of the pandemic, you know, made businesses and investors to see lucrative opportunities and business potentials in the edtech markets. And so many um, edtech companies and solutions began to spring up, but then they rushed to bring these solutions to market so that investors can begin to receive returns on their investments meant that many of them, you know, were not properly built or they were poorly built. They did not adhere to some of the best practices around cybersecurity and data privacy. And, you know, a number of them were not robustly tested as well. And because regulators were not uh, quite prepared 
to deal with the sudden flood of products that began to emerge at the time. A number of these products made it to the market without proper regulatory scrutiny. Now, in a world where decisions and actions are increasingly digitalized and data-driven, intermediated by technology, no one wants their behavior incident records from high school to end up in the hands of employers or recruiters several years later. The consequences could be damning, you know, especially as we begin to discuss issues of race and disability and, um, you know, migration and various other adjoining issues. Now, in the Global South context, where regulation is ineffective, and basically absent for most jurisdictions or for many jurisdictions, I would say, the impact is more far reaching. So how do we move forward from here? I think the first thing we need to do at this juncture is we need to begin to have regulators and government security experts begin to take a closer look at their tech solution that we have on the market today so that they could advise educational administrators accordingly. You know, just like the US FTC um, did with EdTech giant Chegg recently, I think that was in the US, if I remember correctly, um, because actually some of these EdTech solutions that we have seen um, could be systematically violating human rights at scale. And also we need to have educational administrators begin to seek professional help. Now, choosing EdTech solutions should not be only a question of pedagogy and um, you know, um, learning capabilities that these solutions provide. EdTech professional or EdTech administ or sorry, educational administrators now need to seek professional help from security experts and IT experts, you know, before adopting EdTech solutions. They need to understand what are the implications of how these EdTech solution is performing. Beyond the pedagogic, pedagogic affordances of these solutions, we need to understand how could they, you know, bring about consequences inadvertently in the long run that could be um, unpleasant or retributive to both learners and teachers and alumni many years later. And then uh, finally, we also need to um, have learners, you know, to begin to have a say, learners should be allowed a say in all the decisions and consultations regarding edtech solutions that are being chosen for their use. And we discussed this at length in a recent paper that was published um, last year with Veli and a colleague of ours. Um, you can pick up that reading. We are gonna put the link in the chat and then we hope that you would engage further from here. Thank you very much. I'll yield the floor back to Veli. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, we have uh, very few minutes left. I appreciate um, everyone's presentations. I just wanted to, uh, before before we uh, get into uh, uh, some Q and A for the remaining time, I wanted to quickly just mention that yeah, in the rush of uh, you know uh, providing connectivity and access to internet, it's also important to um, uh, kind of you know do this with with critical perspective in mind and um, yes, and and really think about uh, governing and and putting some appropriate measures to to ensure that. Um, all the risks relating to, you know, datafication, surveillance, techno-determinism don't swoop in along the way. Um, educational development specifically is not merely about scaling or mixing up existing ed tech, as we heard from, uh, from Molly. Uh, we do need the, um, you know, the perspective of young people as well, the way we heard from, uh, from Samantha and from Emmanuel as well. Um, I, I, I just wish to, to mention a quick um, analogy that's a, a very simple metaphor with regards to governance of, uh, of ed tech and AI coming into education. Um, it is, um, you know, when, when we want to protect children from fast driving cars on the roads, we impose policies, room, uh, uh, rules and procedures, and we put, uh, put in speed cameras. And the speed cameras are a way to monitor and control uh, and to ensure that um, all the drivers observe these limitations. And in AI and ed tech, uh, in education, there is neither speed cameras at the design stage of these products, nor in the market as they operate. So to monitor, control the sector, let's, let's think about installing these appropriate speed cameras, so to speak. Um, uh, but beyond that, if we have to also address, um, you know, from, from the uh, uh, governance of educational data, what sort of data is being collected? What is the appropriateness? What is the, the, the purpose and the, um, um, uh, what is really the need and whom does this benefit? Can we, can we uh, put proper, um, appropriate measures to, to ensure that, you know, whatever data is being collected, there, there is a, a substantial necessity for using that. And for industry, we also need to think in terms of governance uh, with regards to um, 
you know, uh, make data processing observable. We need more transparency on that. And then from educational perspective, again, we need to continue to introduce where it hasn't uh, learning and teaching data use and purpose and, and literacies. Um, so uh, I, I want to thank everybody for, for the excellent pre presentations, a lot of um, food for thought and questions. Um, I wanted to pass on to Roberto to see if anyone on uh, from his side has any questions for, for the panelists. Thank you very much, Belly. Um, anyone would like to intervene, make a comment or a question in the room? Okay, I think it was clear. Do you, do you want to make an intervention? Yes, I think we have one. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation made by the lady who spoke about uh, education in contemporary. I think the session was uh, titled, uh, there were many, many research that she shared. I would be very interested to find if she can share more material with us about uh, digital literacies and inclusion in maybe contemporary African countries. Since this session was about Global South, the example she made was from uh, only Brazil. It would be very interesting to learn about uh, more case studies from uh, especially the African continent. That's my contribution and question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think back to you, Veli. Thank you, Sam. Um, I think there was a, a lot uh, of uh, input from your end for the um, African, uh, yeah, within the um, African context on uh, digital literacies. Um, uh, would you like to make a comment on that, or perhaps share some uh, some more of your research? Yes. Yeah, so, in terms of the the initiatives that are based in Africa, I am quite excited to see this emerging space as well um, especially some of the things that i mentioned around for example even the internet forum that's happened the african internet governance forum that's happening um, or that has emerged since 2012 in kenya and it was held this year in Mal in malawi and so one of the things that i am really keen to see really emerging from this context is not only the focus on the digital skills, because the thematic areas that have been described in the African Internet Governance Forum um, was really our own affordable and meaningful access, cybersecurity, and also digital infrastructure. And one of the things, um, or some of the events that preceded the Afri African Internet Governance Forum was, it was preceded by three events. So first, the School on Internet Governance, Youth Africa and IGF, Internet Gov Gov Governance For Forum, and also the Parliamentarian Symposium. So we see that even though you have this broad forum that's happening, there are things in the background happening, and I'm particularly keen to see what will emerge from the spaces of the youth and young people. And as part of this, and you know, as part of the forum within um, the African Internet Governance Forum, there is really, you can see a commitment where they are actively participating in the development and adoption of norms and regulations and policies and even standards and protocols within Africa for data protection and overall internet go governance needs within the African context. And there is a special emphasis that has been placed on the Malabo Convention. And really the Malabo Convention really envisions Africa as a single entity in terms of data and privacy protections and calls for really a more harmonized, independent and robust legal framework, which protects all people from processors and data controllers. So I am excited to see what's happening in this space and how young people especially will be, their voices will be given you know, amplified and given a little bit more um, meaning within these conversations around internet governance. 
Thank you very much. And as we're reaching towards the end, I'm seeing that there's another question in the chat on how does one prepare learners for critical disposition? In fact, that's, that was one, one of my questions that I had uh, uh, put down to ask for later. And I guess it, it's reflective. It is a question that, that should address everybody. Um, we've brought in on the panel um, you know, the perspectives and the research from uh, from uh, aspects where di where digital technologies are becoming part and parcel of the of the learning educational process and the pedagogical process. And we're seeing, you know, some of the, the negative aspect that we look out for, um, which should be um, a kind of a model to uh, both to 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 look for for uh, better ways for better governance when we're introducing technologies elsewhere where these are are still not you know ubiquitous. Um, I guess we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate Roberto's uh, um, uh, help on site. And I want to uh, say thank you to all the panelists and, um, and our audience. Um, and I, I, I look forward to further connecting and I hope that we can, um, yeah, we can have more opportunities to meet at uh, future IGF. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Belly. Thank you everyone. The session is closed now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.